All right, this is the second of three lessons that I put together on cellular respiration. The first one was on glycolysis. This one will be on what I will refer to as the Krebs cycle. And the last one will be on oxidative phosphorylation. So what we have already seen is that things that you take in through your diet, your food are broken down into their building blocks. So in your food, fats, carbohydrates, proteins that are broken down into their building blocks, fatty acids, amino acids, monosaccharides. And that in fact is the one that we have here. Glucose is a monosaccharide. And that's the one that we're gonna focus on kind of throughout cellular respiration. So that glucose is going to make its way into the cells and the process of glycolysis, which really just does mean the splitting of sugar or the splitting of glucose, it takes place in the cytosol of the cell. So it does not require the mitochondria at all for glycolysis. Overall, what's happening is you're taking a six carbon compound, the glucose, and splitting it into two pyruvate molecules, each of which have three carbons. Okay, so three carbons in each of the two pyruvate. We start with one glucose, which of course has uh, six carbons in it. So when you do split it apart, that is going to result in the generation of the usable form of energy, ATP. Something that they don't have on here that's also produced that we saw is reducing power in ADH. And eventually that's gonna make its way into the mitochondria and will be used for the third stage of cellular respiration oxidative phosphorylation. This ATP, again, it's not a lot. It's not enough, enough for your cells to survive. They do need, need more ATP. So in order to generate that ATP, what is left over from the breakdown of glucose, which is the pyruvate, is gonna be shuttled into the mitochondria, and it's there that it's going to be completely torn apart. Remember that in the cytosol, glycolysis is an anaerobic process. It does not require any oxygen. In the mitochondria, um, what requires oxygen is actually not until the very, very end, oxidative phosphorylation, but none of these reactions in the mitochondria, including the Krebs cycle, will take place in the absence of oxygen. So the mitochondria reactions, they are aerobic, requiring oxygen, whereas glycolysis in the cytosol, anaerobic. In this picture here, it does have um, this labeled as, in the mitochondria, the tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's sometimes abbreviated as the TCA cycle. It's also called the citric acid cycle because that is the first compound formed in this cycle. And I just refer to it as the Krebs cycle. And that's what you should know it as, is the Krebs cycle. So this pyruvate, when it is in the uh, mitochondria. It's really in the mitochondrial matrix where the Krebs cycle is taking place. And it's here that, like I said, it's torn apart. And the three carbons from pyruvate, eventually they are going to be released in the form of carbon dioxide. Tearing a part of the pyruvate is going to extract or rather convert that form of chemical energy into another form of chemical energy. We can see here that some more ATP is made, but notice that it's still not a lot. So it was two ATP from each glucose made in glycolysis. It's two ATP from each glucose that is made involving the Krebs cycle as well. But there is some more reducing power, NADH, and also another one that's abbreviated FADH2. These are also produced in the Krebs cycle and can be used once again later in oxidative phosphorylation. This picture here of the Krebs cycle, I really like this one because it truly is simple and it is the basics of what you do need to understand for Biology 20. There is something missing here, however. We haven't talked about this, acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is a two carbon compound and where did this two carbon compound actually come from? Well, that pyruvate, when it entered into the mitochondria, if I just put pyruvate over here, it is converted into acetyl-CoA. But pyruvate is a three carbon compound. Acetyl-CoA is a two carbon compound. So what happened to that third carbon? 
Well, now we see the, for the first time the production of the waste, one of the products of cellular respiration, which is carbon dioxide. So this step is what I call the intermediate step because it's not really part of the Krebs cycle. It is acetyl-CoA that enters into the Krebs cycle, not the pyruvate. And this is the step that's necessary from when the pyruvate comes into the mitochondria before we can, we'll talk about the Krebs cycle and the events of the Krebs cycle. A couple of other things happen here as well. What is this CoA? Well, CoA is an enzyme. So we're going to take this coenzyme, CoA enzyme. It's going to be added to the two-carbon compound to form the acetyl-CoA. And there's one other important thing happening here. There is some reducing power that is made. So for each one of the pyruvate, there's going to be one NADH that is produced in converting the pyruvate into the acetyl-CoA. So what this picture here is showing is for each one of the pyruvates. And you have to keep in mind that from glycolysis, each glucose generated two pyruvate. But for each one of these pyruvate, we're then going to get one NADH produced here. We're going to get our one acetyl-CoA, and it's this acetyl-CoA that's going to enter into the Krebs cycle. So I'm not going to give you too many details here, but there is another compound that's a four-carbon compound. So that's what's going to join together with our two-carbon acetyl-CoA to form a six-carbon compound. And now we're going to go through this cycle. Through this cycle, we're eventually going to get back to that same four-carbon compound. So how do you go from a six carbon to a four carbon compound? Well, you kick out some carbon dioxide here and you kick out some here. Again, it's a waste, so that's really not our primary focus here. Our primary focus is not the waste, but it's the energy conversions. So when we take that energy from the acetyl-CoA, introduce it into the Krebs cycle, what are the other energy forms that we're going to convert it into? So for each turn of the Krebs cycle, what we see is we're going to get one, two, three. NADHs that are produced. Remember we have this one up here, but that's not part of the Krebs cycle, that's the intermediate step. But for strictly the Krebs cycle, we have our one, two, three NADHs that are produced. We also have this other form of reducing power. We have one FADH2 that is produced. And for each turn of the Krebs cycle, it is one ATP that is produced. So the tally of this at the bottom for each single cycle, and again, this is strictly the Krebs cycle, it's not the intermediate step. It is one ATP, one FADH2, three NADHs. Remember that from each glucose, we actually have two pyruvate. So if we wanna know per glucose, what we're generating in the Krebs cycle, then we just need to double all of those numbers. So per glucose, it's now two ATP, two FADH2, and six NADH that are generated from each turn of the Krebs cycle. So if we kind of tally up everything that we have so far in terms of our energy conversions, our different forms of energy that have been produced along the way, Remember that from glycolysis, we had a net gain of two ATP. From the Krebs cycle, for each glucose, we have two more ATP. NADHs, we had two of them from glycolysis. We have two of them from the intermediate step, one from each pyruvate. We have six of them from the Krebs cycle, one from each acetyl-CoA. So now we have 10 NADHs that have been produced right from the beginning. And we have our two FADH2s. So ATP can be used right away. These ones here, uh, the reducing power, those are ones that will carry on to the third stage of cellular respiration and be used to make more ATP 
in oxidative phosphorylation. I'll just finish it off by showing you this uh, more complicated picture here, just so again you can kind of appreciate that it is more complicated. Many intermediates along the way, as we can see, for example, with this one right here, alpha, -ketoglut alpha ketoglutarate, and a whole bunch of enzymes, all of these along here, they are enzymes catalyzing these reactions. But in terms of what you really need to know, it is what we just saw on the previous slide. So take pyruvate, convert it into acetyl-CoA. This is where we have some carbon dioxide that has been produced. This is where NADH is produced, one carbon dioxide per pyruvate, one NADH per pyruvate. And we also have some, um, uh, sorry, of our acetyl-CoA. We have one of those produced for each one of the pyruvate. So now it's our acetyl-CoA that's going to enter into the Krebs cycle for each turn of the Krebs cycle. Again, just ignoring all the details, what do we have? NADH1, NADH2, NADH3 that we're getting. ATP, this one here, GTP, is actually converted into ATP. So that's our one ATP for each turn of the Krebs cycle. I don't see it here for some reason, but somewhere along the way here, there's also going to be that other form of reducing power NADH2 that is also going to be produced. So the next lesson that we'll get to is going to take these reducing power NAD and FADH2 and use that to make more ATP.